Under the gun as far as the clock today. So, welcome to All Hell Can't Stop Us. I am Jeff Cliff. This is my weekly blog slash podcast slash alternative to the IFPI, RIA, MBA, Netflix, etc. And today we have a special guest. We have Silver Beast Adam Knudsen. Uh, say hello, Adam. See if we can hear you out there. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Adam's a little glitchy because he is all the way around the world right now. This is truly the most global show we've ever had to date. And so today I wanted to talk a little bit more about what I was talking about last week, which was C-51, but specifically some of the background of C-51 and what rights have been removed from us. And so I just wanted to kind of very quickly uh, quote a couple of things, and then I'll kind of give Adam a little bit of a chance to chip in here. But from two pretty different places here, we've got... The, again, World Socialist website, which I'm sure Adam will just love my quoting, but if it will load here, this is uh, my, my lovely Chromebook running out of RAM. That's what this is. But, okay, there we go. So, this is in re- reference to the previous Anti-Terror Act, the Anti-Terror Act of 2001, that was, re- that quote, lapsed in 2007 under a sunset clause, prevented det- detention and investigative hearings. The And then there was a Combating Terrorist Act that was passed, after the 2001 Act lapsed, to basically reinforce the claims that were made in the sunset clauses of the original Anti-Terrorist Act. So, quote, the Canada's Conservative government has ran through legislation through Parliament that in the name of fighting terrorism tramples on fundamental democratic or juridical, juridical? Hmm. principles, including habeas corpus, the right to silence, and the right to challenge one's accusers. So this is then echoed over and over again from across the political spectrum. And I've got a couple of other examples here Quote, from the Liquid VPN, talking more about uh, C-51, quote, a bill in, which is a clear violation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as well as removing our legal protections enshrined in the Magna Carta for 800 years. So again, this is, the anti-terror acts are, go back to these, these ancient laws, and we're going to go a little bit more in, in depth to these ancient laws as we kind of go. But there's one more here I have. This is a a letter to the Senate from Human Rights Watch, again, referring to the the Bill C-51, which is just part of the tradition, this recent tradition of revoking our ancient rights that goes right to the the core of what makes us Canadian. And I'm just going to quote from them if if this page will load for me. So slow with this video stream going on. (laughs) But... Okay, so there we go. So Canada's Parliament created special advocates to represent non-U.S. or non-citizens in 2008 after the Supreme Court ruled that the previous system, i.e. the one mentioned in 2007 that lapsed, uh, which authorized the prolonged detention of de- or deportation of non-citizens without allowing them to examine the evidence against them, violated the rights of, to liberty and habeas corpus under the Canadian Charter. So, this, again... Both the anti, the original Anti-Terror Acts of 2001 and C-51 are violating these two things, this habeas corpus and the Magna Carta. So the question is then, what is habeas corpus? What is this the Magna Carta and why is it important? And so I, I just wanted to, to go into a little bit of the detail on that. Uh, but I do, as mentioned, have Adam here. So Adam, one, do you think it's accurate to say that the original 2001 Anti-Terror Act and the current 2000 
15C51, as well as the, the kind of intervening laws that have been passed. When they say, both on the, on the left side of the political spectrum and the right, that it is violating these two things, the habeas corpus and the Magna Carta, is this accurate to say? The, uh, you are breaking that up pretty bad. <laughs> I think it's a little better when you talk slowly. Okay. But, but yeah, no, both of these things are bad. And they, they do violate rights that were fought for, that were negotiated centuries, centuries and centuries ago. And it's a, it's a real, real serious step back towards tyranny, which is where we're going to end up as these things slowly and slowly progress. So it's, it's, a real, it's a real dangerous slope that we're sliding down right now. Right. And so when we talk about sliding down to tyranny, it's, it's useful to have a measuring stick sometimes to, to say, okay, exactly how far are we from where it has really gone too far and where it has really gone all bad? And one of the best ways you can measure it is the habeas corpus and the Magna Carta, because they are so old and so tested that we can tell right away that if the ruler is acting more like a king, and or not even a king, but an absolute monarch, a, a, someone who's justifying their actions purely by reference to their position of authority rather than the rule of law, that they won't abide by basic protections as enshrined in these two documents. And so in the case of, let's go to the first one here. So in the case of the habeas corpus, in the Canadian Constitution, in the Charter of Rights of Freedom, quote, under Section 10, everyone has the right on arrest or detention, A, to be informed promptly of the reasons, therefore, pause, this is, a, a, again, something that C-51 has removed, B, to retain and instruct counsel without delay and to be informed of that right, pause, this is also something C-51 has removed, C, to have the validity of the detention determined by way of habeas corpus and to be released if the detention is not lawful. And so what it, it's, it's important enough of a document that it's right there in our Constitution to be mentioned there. And so we have here, Wikipedia lists a couple of situations where the government has suspended it. And in each one of those cases, you can kind of see that it's the government taking extreme measures to deal with a particular crisis that was then limited in nature, and then the rights were reaffirmed shortly afterwards. So, for example, in the October crisis, it was called a crisis. Uh, the War Measures Act was, was put into place, but then eventually removed when it was clear that Canada was safe and the threat, even as ridiculous as it was, was dealt with. Same thing during the Fenian crisis, where Canada was actually invaded. Quote, or rather, it was the right was removed, but it wasn't actually used. Even when Canada was being invaded by foreign nationals, an army of them, it still wasn't enough, in the early days at least. And of course, using it against the Italian Canadians, Japanese Canadians, German Canadians, and Ukrainian Canadians when they were put into concentration camps as well. So it's clearly important. But, Adam, do you want to mention a little bit more on the history of it, as far as why historically it has been important? Well, the, the reference to the Magna Carta there, the reason that it's in the Magna Carta itself, because back in that 1215 time frame, where the nobles, the barons were unhappy with the king, and they, uh, they met to agree on this Magna Carta, because the king was being too much of a tyrant. And the Magna Carta is, I think, 63 different points some very interesting special points of them, but one of the major ones is the writ of habeas corpus. And habeas corpus is the Latin term, so I, I would say it predates 1215, probably going all the way back to, to Roman times. Mm -hmm. And it's a very simple legal principle. It's not that you can't arrest somebody. It's not that you can't charge somebody. It's that if you're going to do so, you must do so justly. And so a defense is simply habeas corpus. Show me the body. You can't have a ruler, a sovereign, your government simply arrest people and charge people, claim that you murdered somebody, and then be like, yeah, but there's no body, like, there's no evidence. You need to actually have some evidence that the charge is valid. And so that's why habeas corpus is important, because if you don't have habeas corpus, then your legal authority can 
simply arrest you and then don't have to actually provide any evidence for why you're being arrested. And that is just injustice. Right. So that's why the Magna Carta is referenced in, in the writ of habeas corpus, why that's so important, because it's a very simple to understand legal principle. And in 1215, King John had arrested fucking knights and he was holding these guys for months. And I don't even think he'd actually charged them. He just imprisoned them because right. he was the king. And so that's what we're trying to avoid. And it's interesting to, to note a couple of things uh, in kind of reference to that. As I was kind of reading about this this morning before uh, this show, first of all, it, it's important to note the context of King John being the ruler that he was. The previous ruler, King Richard himself, had been unjustly detained at least once or twice in his life, and very nearly got detained for the rest of his life as as part of it, even as a the king of England uh, and the king of a, a, a huge realm, like one of the bigger nations of its time. Even that wasn't enough to have just the basic rule of law, being able to have some kind of a, tr- a trial where the charges were, were discussed in an open place. Even that wasn't enough for the king. And so there was this context that, well, you know, if even a king can be arrested, what hope is there for the, the, the lowly peasant, never mind the aristocrats who kind of ruled the, the, the countries anyway? So there was something in the mind of the people at the time. King Richard, when he was caught and arrested, it was by a foreign power. Right. And that foreign power held them for four years, I think it was, or, or they at least got four years of English taxes as a king's ransom. Yeah. Which greatly hurt the English nation. So, but, you know, that is injustice. It was an unjust way to deal with a foreign monarch, and that doesn't lead to peace or prosperity between those two nations. Right, just in in the same way that, like, if if a government starts arresting and holding its own citizens, or, or even citizens of other countries who are coming to it in refuge, without trial, without charge, without reason, just under the whim of the government, Again, it's it's a, not a path to peace and prosperity. It's a path to struggle and conflict, right? But the other thing, uh, you, you well, kind of... When, go ahead. When a country imprisons its own people, there's a certain small level of tolerance for it that seems to be able to get away with it. As you get more and more, what happens is the people of the country support the country less until you get to a revolution. Hmm. So if a if a king or if a modern government imprisons too many of their own people, the end result at some point in time has to be revolution because you will lose the support of the people that should be supporting the country because you're just arresting them. It's, are we on the same side or not here? Right. And when you're in the country, you're supposed to be on the side of that country, but if they treat you unjustly, you, there's no reason to be on the side of that country. And, and so, and so the, there, there's a certain the the principles of justice lead to priests and prosperity. Violating those principles of justice lead to discord and revolution. And and those are not those are never nice things to go down. But eventually you might get there. Right. And so C51 pushes Canada another step towards a revolution. Why should the subjects of Canada, the lowly you and me, me and everybody else? that can now be arrested without seeing the Havis Corpus evidence against us, why should we be loyal to that? Exactly. You know, we should oppose that. And so it's worth reiterating. You, you, you kind of said this when a couple of minutes ago, but it's, it's worth re-pointing it out, which is that the government, even uh, under an extreme situation, like, for example, if the, the, the monarch or the, 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 the absolute ruler as long as they're they're bound by habeas corpus, they can still make laws that where you can be imprisoned, and even large numbers of people can be imprisoned. They can still make the laws. They can still arrest you, and in even in cases where like kettling is used, for example, that is still allowed. You're allowed to arrest entire streetfuls of people, and you can still get to this extreme point where ever, you have a, a prison state like the you know, some parts of the United States where a significant portion of the population is imprisoned, but there is this procedural requirement, a basic requirement that the whole thing be done under some pretext of justice, under some law that has been agreed upon using the way that laws are agreed upon in that particular country, 
In the case of Canada, that would be by through the House of Commons, going through the Senate, getting royal approval, but in principle, having some feedback from the population as far as how that law is decided. In the case of Canada, that feedback is through a democratic form. And reminder for those listening, we are in election season, so you do have some ability to choose the future of how this country is governed. And so, But as long as that law has been passed, you can be arrested, you can be charged for whatever reason the law seems fit to describe as just. Now, we can argue about whether the law itself is just, but there has to be a law. Whereas if there is no law, if it's just whatever the government wants, then that that slippery slope is there for the government or the, the executive of the government to just willy-nilly apply it everywhere. And it becomes really, really easy to fall down into using it more and more and more. Well, you referenced the October crisis of 1970. Even when Pierre Trudeau did that, it was highly, highly contentious that he bothered to do that at all. Like, because when he invoked the War Measures Act, he suspended civil rights and liberties for all Canadians for a problem that was isolated in Quebec. And he deployed the military, and he deployed all these other resources, but he probably could have done that without the War Measures Act. He probably could have just put security forces out without actually invoking the War Measures Act, which violates everybody's civil rights and liberties. And uh, if we want to talk in the context of the Magna Carta, King John signed it in 1215 and then immediately began ignoring it because he didn't like the document as it was. And the barons and nobles had him killed in 1216. So <laughs> that's the history of what happens when you don't follow these legal justice principles that we have. And I think it's also so, important to, to mention the next step after that. And there may be a couple steps that you can fill in before this step happened. But it was, if I'm remembering correctly, in 1225, that this is after the, the barons fought, kind of lost their struggle, and then another struggle happened with the barons, again, trying to get more rights. But the barons won this one, and the, basically the first thing they did is they brought the Magna Carta, put it back on the table, didn't change a, practically a, a word of it, and said, okay, a monarch in play, I think it was Henry III or something, but basically forced him to, to reaffirm that, yes, crown is going to be beholden to the rule of law. And yes, you as the king can make whatever law you want, and we as the subjects will follow whatever law you want, other than these 63 exceptions, and there were some little exceptions in there. But one of the main one, ones was that there has to be this habeas corpus right, that you have to be able to have a, a process where you can get access to a court, or at, le or at least if, if you're being detained, to be released if they can't prove that it's legal for you to be detained. So. Well, because otherwise... King John or Richard or Henry or whoever the sovereign ends up becoming, without that, they could arrest anybody for any reason, for whatever. And so you need to have that in play or else tyranny is just obvious. Tyranny is what would happen. So it's, it's very critical that you have those measures in place. Otherwise, you don't have justice. And where there is no justice, there can be no peace. So there's some other really interesting things in the uh, Magna Carta and if you actually read through, it's very difficult reading. There's 63 things, and most of them have been repealed by some matter of the House of Commons or law over and, the last 800 years. Right, and this goes, again, way before the, the founding of Canada. But because Canada was part of the British Empire, it inherits this legal tradition. And so, yes, there are little things about it that were clearly archaic, little clauses of those 63 clauses one for example i found today was like women don't have the right to basically cause someone else to be imprisoned unless their husbands were murdered that that's kind of an example of something today in the 21st century we might have a different opinion of than uh, the original authors had but nevertheless there was this just well, sort of key part to read that there's one that talks about the king shall remove fishing weirs mm -hmm these fishing weirs on the River Thames and, and throughout the country. And, and we might not look at that today and say, well, we understand it very good. But it's, it's kind of interesting because the, the fishing weirs would prevent travel.
travel by boat up and down the rivers. And so when the king would put those in, it would restrict travel for all these boats. Mm. And it was in the Magna Florida, and that's actually one of our first indicators of the right of travel, the right, the freedom of movement superseded those fishing rears of the king. And so that's one of the very first examples where we actually have the freedom to travel. So, so the in, the, in the modern time, uh, Adam, <laughs> the, is there any restrictions on the freedom to travel that maybe have come up? Because you travel a lot. You're, as I mentioned, all the way across the world right now. What would be a, a, a modern example of the, the kind of more general rule that isn't enshrined in the Constitution because they, they didn't have the ability to fight for those more general rules at that point? But So what would be a, a way of kind of comparing and contrasting to the modern world? How are we restricted from traveling? Well, right now in the modern world, you know, the waterways was the common way of mass transit back in the day. And now we've gone to public roadways, which are basically owned by the public, and therein anybody is allowed to use them, basically. So it's a public roadway. Everybody's allowed access. It's very comparable to the waterways, and a lot of the laws kind of mimic things that went on in the waterways. They move from the sea to these roadways. If you look at international travel nowadays, now you're required to get a passport, generally, if you're going to go internationally. You show up to some border without a passport, you're probably not going to get through nowadays. You actually have to go through border checkpoints nowadays. So that's another restriction. If you go down to the USA, even by car, at random, they might be searching your trunk or searching your this, and they could be searching your cell phones. We've got a big fight about that in Canada now because they want to demand your password to the cell phone. So I haven't been subject to that one, but that one will last me in court when it comes up someday, and then we'll see We'll see how long they jail me for uh, trying to get access to my cell phone. I'm a little bit frustrated today because I did travel to Bangkok, and I was talking to you just an hour ago about it, but I've been to Bangkok five times, Thailand five times, and I thought it was weird. On my first time in 2011, I flew back through Japan, and all the people that went into Japan had to go one way and get fingerprinted and go into Japan. And I had to go for an international connection, so you avoid all that security screening, go off, stay in the international side of the airport, got my next connecting flight. And it was like, well, never going to Japan. Apparently what's happened now in Thailand is they've signed on to some international agreement to take everybody's fingerprints as they enter the country. So they're going to be throwing these things into a database. They're going to be running them against the database to try to check to see if people are criminals. They'll be trying to flag it. You know they're going to be sharing that information. And it's at the border checkpoint when they search your trunk or if they take your fingerprints, to me, that's an all unlawful search or seizure. It's an unlawful search of your vehicle. It's an unlawful search of your body. It's an unlawful seizure of your data, in my opinion. And it, it's happening now further. It's just one step after another after another. And, and, and you know, it's, it's worth pointing out at this point that there, it's one thing for them to do these sorts of things purely at the border. And if, if it's just the border keeping people from outside of the country coming into that country. It's, it's sad. And in many cases, it may be against this kind of broader spirit of liberty. But there's also another, a second worrying trend, which is these restrictions are being pushed interior to countries and in travel interior to countries. So, for example, in Canada, if you fly in an airport in Canada from one city to another, even if you're only staying in Canada, even if you're only staying within the province you live in, like, for example, going from Thunder Bay to Toronto, you're still going through the same or at least more or less the same security checkpoints that you would as if you had left the country. Now, the, the, some of the laws are different. Like, for example, traveling with money, you can get in a lot more trouble by going to the States with a lot of money than by going from, say, Toronto to Thunder Bay. But again, things like this, this fingerprinting thing, right now I don't think we have that in Canada yet. But if it's happened in Japan, so. and if it's happened in Thailand, and if it spreads even across the, the Pacific Rim, right? I mean, Canada's part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So there is this precedence, this legal precedence for restrictions on our liberty to flow across and interior to that particular region of which Canada is a member. 
In addition, there are other large agreements like NAFTA, for example, that was, again, strengthened by the Security and Prosperity, I uh, can't remember what the other P is, but the SBP, which I think I'm going to do a little bit more in depth on another show. Uh, again, these, these issues of how people are restricted from free travel don't just stay in one country, and they don't just stay on the borders of countries. They move, and they have been spreading deeper and deeper into our lives. Well, and, and part of the problem is it, it becomes normalization. At first, it was Japan, and so it was easy enough to say, I'm not going to Japan. But Japan was doing it, and they must have been pushing it, because apparently it's a group of Southeast Asian countries. So I know Singapore was listed as one of the countries. It's probably Thailand, and it's probably a whole bunch of them, probably China. We know they're not very free. And if, if, and if it includes China, then Hong Kong will be next, if they aren't in already, right? Well, they're going to try to conquer Hong Kong, basically, so... Yeah, Hong Kong will be in it. But the part of the problem is is that we have so many North American people travel to these destinations. They just sort of roll over and get used to it, right? No, that's just normal. That's okay. That's just normal. That's just the way it is. And so as it expands and expands and expands, there's not as much resistance as there should be on this kind of thing. Like, And we had this happen in Canada after 9-11. Like when I was young, I used to drive to the USA in the States. I think we went with birth certificates when we were very young with our parents. But then when I was 16, I had a and your parents, license. Your, your parents no doubt had driver's licenses that were also one of the things they asked for at the border, which, again, is, is not really a big deal, especially when I don't think back then they even had photos on them. They certainly didn't have computers in them, but they were just cards basically saying, yeah, I'm a Canadian. I can legally drive the vehicle I'm in. Yeah, you, you ask a few questions back and forth, and it, it was generally pretty... I mean, there were some people that could tear people's cars apart was one of the things, but we never had that happen to us, thankfully, but generally it was pretty easy. And when I, I was 16, 17, right up until into my 20s, because 9-11, I was, I was 18, and, and the passport stuff came in shortly after that. I used to drive down to USA to grab car parts or this or that, and it was just a license, Never really had a lot of troubles getting in and out. I found it worse coming back into Canada as a Canadian, always, even to this day, which I think is kind of interesting. But it used to be just a driver's license. Now, if you look at a passport, well, you got to fill out all this information. you got to pay the money for all the overhead administration. You need to put references down. And they, they used to be like doctors or your pastor or people that knew you for five-plus years all these different things, and some people might not know somebody who is close to them at this point in time that's known them for three plus years. So, but we've just sort of normalized it now, because I think everybody that grows up now would just kind of assume that, well, that's just the way it is. Right. And so you got to go through all these hoops to do it. And then, I mean, the conversations I had with the poor uh, immigration officials at the Bangkok airport here, that a whole big group of them spent an hour and a half debating this with me, the lady's like, well, we have to do this to, to keep our country safe. How do we know you're not a criminal? And I'm thinking to myself, you've already got my passport. Why can't you have an information agreement that when this passport's agreed, you get a criminal record? And oh, no, Canada protects that. Day. We need your fingerprint. Well, how in the world is my fingerprint going to identify me as a criminal then? If you can't even get yeah. it from my passport. <laughs> Suddenly you're going to run it through my... So if, if I rent a car and that car ends up getting rented by somebody else and ends up in some investigation in the future, how am I not to show up as a possible suspect now on this thing? So if I were, if I rent a car today and I come back in three years, maybe it'll flag me then. And we know these kinds of problems are going to happen. And it's kind of a violation of habeas corpus. Well, you know, there's not really evidence, but we got your fingerprint on that car. Right. Well, does that really mean anything? Just because the next guy rented it and ran drugs or the next guy rented it and killed somebody with it, suddenly I'm a suspect without any evidence. And we just sort of normalize this behavior. And then you're right. After it's normalized throughout the international world, it'll start moving domestically. What's to say that the RCMP doesn't show up on highway number one up east or west side of some city and just run a thousand officers and everybody that's coming through, just fingerprint them and check them there. And what it'll basically amount to is like these current stop checks, violations of people, search and seizures. We actually weren't suspects. We weren't partaking in any crime. We weren't doing anything this, but 
in the future you're going to see just a big shutdown, lockdown, check everybody out. These kinds of things happen in the States, and uh, the USA is a... Like, it, you you're, you mean the, the checkpoints in between cities, right? Or at yeah, least on like highways. Especially in the southern cities. Yeah. You can watch all kinds of very interesting videos with guys arguing with these border patrol people, but they'll go through, like, a border checkpoint way north of the actual Mexico-American border. Yeah, th- this is, like, the equivalent of this would be, like, either just leaving Regina or even, like, on Regina's, maybe not Ring Road, but, like, a a major drag in the city to go from one part of the city to the other, like kind of like from the university area to the north end sort of thing. And they'll just pull you, everyone over. It would be comparable to doing a great big checkpoint just before Estevan or 20 minutes north of Estevan or just south of Weyburn. So they'll take an entire interstate down in, in Texas and they'll stop everybody and basically run them through a border control checkpoint. And so there's some people that are, they go back and forth and they have a little bit of fun with these things trying to stand up for their rights. Border guard asks the guy, are you an American citizen? He asks back, well, are you an American citizen? Yeah. Well, this is a border checkpoint. The guy's like, did I cross the border? Oh, and he's 20 miles into Texas already or 50 miles or up to 100 miles inside of Texas. And they're stopping everybody like the checkpoint. And then they'll have a secondary where they want to search the vehicle. And so they get into these big arguments back and forth. But because we've normalized it at the border, why can't we normalize it at the edge of some city? I mean, if Thailand needs my fingerprints to stay safe, what's to say Winnipeg doesn't need my fingerprints to stay safe? Yeah, like, for example, we know that after that, there was a guy who rode a Greyhound bus, and, like, at some point in this trip in the Greyhound bus, he just snapped and started murdering people on the bus in really gruesome ways and cut one guy's head completely off and just, like, had this huge break in, in reality and a lot of people got really damaged and hurt and killed because of it and so as a response to that measures that would normally have occurred for greyhound travelers between canada and the united states suddenly found themselves in between manitoba and thunder bay say or manitoba and saskatchewan so all it really takes for this sort of thing to to make that jump from international to domestic is one person one admittedly terrible person or a person who does terrible things, but that's it. And there's, what, 40 million Canadians. The chances of any individual one of them snapping is pretty low, but over the, the decades, it, we can probably guess that someone else is going to do this. Like, there's someone who's going to murder people in a gruesome way. This just happens in the long term. I, I can't remember what year that happened, but it, I know it wasn't very long ago, 10, 15 years ago type time frame, maybe not even 10. But, so there's this whole premise that, well, we have to do all this security theater now, search your belongings, run your stuff through metal scan detectors, not allowed to carry all this stuff on the bus, on and on it goes. That individual is back out on the streets. Right. So on, on one hand, we're gonna do all of this security theater keep you safe, but the guy that actually committed that crime, eh, he just gets to walk around free man today. And then this hasn't been that long. Right. No, so, it, it really hasn't. No, because I mean, I was, I was pretty much an adult, I think, when that happened. So, I mean, I'm sure it's less than 20 years. It's probably less than 10. Yeah. But, but it, that it, individual has been like five years in jail or, or less in a mental facility, and now he's just been released on his meds again without supervision. And that incident allegedly happened because he was off of his men. So, but now we got a, there's a million or so travelers by bus on an inner city, inner city connection system. And I don't take the bus, but I'm sure they're being subject to a bunch of these checks or metal scans or pat downs on their body. Now, at this point, I will give like a little plug to the Saskatchewan Rider Express. Although they're not the STC, because they're newer than this attack, they didn't inherit any security theater from it. And getting on the bus is as simple as buying a ticket, getting on the bus, just as it should be. And getting off the bus is as simple as they tell you that you're at your destination and you get off the bus and everyone's happy. And so I got to give some credit at this point to Rider Express for at least not having this, this problem yet. But I'm, I, I worry sometimes that the next attack, they will inherit it. But it's also worth pointing out, and you mentioned this kind of earlier, but there seems to be like a, a difference in what is kind of the most valuable to 
the public at large in terms of having rights that are absolute or having a ruler that is absolute. And I found a quote here in uh, a legal write-up of C-51 here. Uh, let's see if I can pull it up. Maybe, oh, here we go. For, and this is from the National Security Law blog. And so just quickly kind of going through it, quote, powers will allow CSIS to breach law or the charter without warrant domestically. And key points, this is different or very different from search and arrest warrants. Those are tied to charter rights and or that have qualifying language in the right itself. I, so the, quote, Section 8 of the Charter only guards against unreasonable searches and seizures. Section 9 only protects against arbitrary detention. And, quote, most other charter rights are not imbued with qualifying language. There is no concept of permissible free speech or arbitrary cruel and unusual punishment or appropriate mobility rights to enter or leave the country or limited habeas corpus. So this, this idea of habeas corpus is not something that can be legislated around or that they can, uh, unless they just utterly withdraw it, and then that's kind of a big warning flag on it and of its own, that there is, there's no like half habeas corpus or like sometimes only kind of habeas corpus. You either have it or you don't. And same thing with free expression. You either have free expression for the, the, the things that you find reprehensible uh, or you really don't. And so it, it's one of those areas where the Canadian public has to choose whether or not it agrees to have these things or the alternative, which is a government, an executive, a person in charge of that government, perhaps, with a, a level of authority approaching something like an emperor or a despot. And so it, it's, again, we are in election season, so if this choice is important, we should be looking to see the options available to us to bring us back to the point where we're not on the, the other side of that. But anyway, we are nearing kind of the end of the show. So do you want to kind of give kind of like a, a quick recap or, or closing remark or anything like that? Well, I, I wanted to add in as a closing remark. The one thing that I've always found quite distasteful is the concept that it's okay because it was a border crossing. It's okay because you were crossing an international country. If I were to look at the USA and Canada, both of us are supposed to have free speech. Both of us are supposed to have Havis Corpus. Both of us are supposed to have a freedom from unreasonable search or seizure. Yet somehow when I go from Canada to the USA, they practically suspend all of that. They can they hold you there, they search your car, you, know, you probably got to be careful with what you say exactly. But the concept to me is we both got habeas corpus. We should be free. We both have the freedom to travel. We should be free. We both have the right in Canada, it's in the Constitution, to remain in, leave, and re-enter the country. The Americans have the same thing. They have an absolute right to enter their country. And I believe they have a right to leave it. Uh, so we have all these rights shared across the international border. But for some mysterious reason, when we show up at the border, suddenly it's either country but both countries are operating there to violate rights and freedoms. So I, I think we need to move to a different concept of this. We need to move it into a different direction where we press for closing down all the American-Canadian border crossings and really have a right to free travel across it. It should merely be a welcome sign with a change of the uh, kilometers to miles per hour sign. That's what it should be. And we should be able to go back and forth as we please with ease without being stopped, without being questioned, without being searched, without some time limit on it, we should be free to do that. So we have these long-established rights that are constantly being whittled away with, and we're not putting enough, uh, enough of a fight that we should be to try to maintain these things. I think the world is going... The world has gotten worse and worse and worse and worse throughout the entirety of my life as I watch these things and, and do a little arguing here and there over it. But I think we've constantly been going the wrong way. Awesome. Well, thanks again for uh, coming on this show with such short notice. But I will be uh, closing this show. And just as a reminder for people listening, one, do some research on the, the parties that are running in the Canadian election right now. See which ones are uh, willing to go against this trend and are willing to allow the right of free travel or even just a little bit more of the right of free travel. Kind of talked about it on previous shows, but... 
again, do your own research there. Two, if you do like this show, please join on Subscriberstar. Take a look at it. Feed more into this so we can keep doing this and keep offering you this weekly broadcast. So thank you, Adam, for helping out. And thank you, everyone else, for listening. And I will see you all later.